Nice to see you guys today. Appreciate you. Thank you for being here, being with us. Life can definitely feel like a battle, right? It can feel like it. Sometimes the simplest things. We dropped my daughter off at college on Friday in Southern California again so that she could like finish out her sophomore year with some of her friends. And so we were glad to do that. And um, we had known for a long time that she needed to get her wisdom teeth out. They were affecting her other teeth, but we kept putting it off. And so somewhere in our procrastinated brilliance, we decided the week before we took her back to school, we would go ahead and get her wisdom teeth pulled out. And then we thought, man, Ethan needs his wisdom teeth out as well. So why don't we just get both of their wisdom teeth out at the same time? Awesome. So we took them to the oral surgeon this last week, you know, and they go in and they do the wisdom teeth thing, and um, they were funny. You know, Lori was telling me, like, the stories. um, Emma comes out in a wheelchair after, you know, they knock her out, take her teeth out, and she's, like, talking, wants to call her friends, wants to FaceTime people, wants to post on social media. (laughs) Lori's like, no, you're not all here. Ethan comes out. He refuses the wheelchair. He's walking, but not normal walking, speed walking, like, mm, you know, 100 miles an hour and talking in a really loud voice. So she gets them in the car. She gets them home. My job was to meet them at home so that I could help Ethan get inside the house. And so I go out to to help him, and Ethan throws the car door open and speed walks past me, kind of sideways, goes into the house. And, and I go over to like, tell him like, Ethan, bro, you got to sit down. You're, you're drugged up right now. You don't really know what's happening. And my son's like, you know, 6'4". He's huge, right? And he literally put his arms on my shoulders. He had a slightly crazy look in his eye and he moved me over. And then he just proceeded to speed walk around the kitchen like a crazy person. And so I'm like, our family's losing their mind. And then there was like lots of blood. Um, one of our kids had a lot of excessive bleeding. And, and so this went on for the next six hours. We had blood and gauze and we had tears. And those tears were, were basically only from one person, my wife, Lori. And my job was to try and keep everybody calm. You know, it's like our house felt like a battle in those six hours. And with, you know, tissues and blood stacked up, it looked a little bit like a battlefield. And life can feel like a battle, even the simplest things. Going to work can feel like a battle. (laughs) Getting to church, come on somebody, can feel like a battle, right? Getting your kids up and ready and awake can feel like a battle. Getting your kids down and asleep can feel like a battle. Pat Benatar told us, love is a battlefield, right? Like we, life can be a battle and certainly this last year we have been in our share of battles. And so we're taking some time to consider over these next several weeks what it looks like for people of faith to fight their battles? How do we fight our battles as believers? And do we fight our battles differently than we would if we weren't believers? And so we talked last week about how if you find yourself in a battle, that just means you're human. God rarely takes his people out of the battle, but he does insert his presence and he does give us tools on how we can fight the battles that we have to fight. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning of verse 15, is a verse that um, we talked about last week. And we're going to read this together. When we get to the red word, I'll ask you to just say it out loud wherever you're at. But this is, um, this, is the, this is the passage. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but whose? God's. The battle is God's. So we may be in the battle, but as believers, we've got to realize God owns the battle, right? We we might have to, to fight in the battle, but God brings the victory in the battle. We may be in the struggle, but we are not in the struggle alone. 
And so I'm going to bring some icons up here and just kind of highlight where we've been and where we're going. When it comes to how we fight our battles, we kicked it off last week by talking about the power of prayer, and I encourage you to check that out if you missed that last week. Today we're going to talk about God's Word as one of the ways that we that empowers us to fight our battles in our lives. Uh, next week we'll look at worship. I can't wait. That's going to be a lot of fun and the power of like worship and, and what that can do for us in our lives as we fight our battles. Then we'll look at gratitude. We'll look at generosity and we'll look at the cross and remembrance, reflecting back on all that God has done in our lives to empower us to move forward. This is not exhaustive, but this is some of the ways we as people of faith fight our battles. And so make sure to be here every week. We're gonna be unpacking this. I think it's gonna be a powerful reminder for kind of how we face the struggles we're up against. Today I wanna talk to you about how we fight our battles with God's word. How we fight our battles with God's word. Stand on God's word and you will stay strong in the battle. Stand on God's word and you will stay strong in the battle. How do we do that? First, we've got to take God's word in. We've got to take it in in our own lives and allow it to impact us. I was, went for a walk with my wife Lori this week and at one point she was talking and I heard the last thing she said. She says, what do you think? And I realized she had been talking for a very long time. You know exactly what, I, what, I'm, what I'm feeling here, right? And I had heard none of it. And then the question becomes, and don't look at me like you've never done this, the question becomes, do I fake it? Right? Do I, do I say something like, yeah, I think, I think that sounds good. What do you think? But instead, I just kind of laughed and I said, I didn't hear anything you just said to me. Could you repeat all of that to me? And she looked at me with this look and I said, what? I'm just doing to you what you always do to me. <laughs> that, that didn't go so well. <laughs> the thing is, we have a lot on our minds. We have a lot going on. It's easy to allow things to just kind of bounce off of us, right? To not even really take them in, to not even really hear. Even now at church, you made the effort to be here. You pushed yourself. You got up. You got ready. You got caffeinated. You sat down. You're in place. You're here. You're ready to go. And some of you are daydreaming right now. In fact, I'm going to do a long pause to bring you back. <laughs> Somebody just said, what, what happened? <laughs> See, a lot of stuff. Right, it just bounces off of us. But here's the thing when it comes to, to God's word. And that's, that's just part of life. We're busy, we have a lot going on. But here's the thing. God, when he is preparing his people to go into battle, when he's getting us ready for the battles we're gonna face, he often challenges his people to lean into his word and to meditate on it, to reflect on it, to store it in their life. Joshua is a great example. Joshua took over the leadership after Moses. Joshua led the Israelite people into the promised land. So Moses led them out of captivity in Egypt, led them, led them through 40 years of wilderness wandering. But when when it came time to enter the land of Israel, the promised land, it was Joshua that led them. Interesting little side note, Joshua is just the Hebrew name of the Greek New Testament name, Jesus. It's, it's the same name, just a different pronunciation. And so commentators have noted that Joshua in the Old Testament led the Israelites into the promised land, just like Jesus in the New Testament leads us into our own promised land through his life, death, and resurrection. Little side note. Joshua is taken over the mantle of leadership. He's about to face all kinds of battles. He's about to be up against all kinds of pressure. And this is what God says to him to kind of get him ready for the battle. Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. God's words. He says this. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be what? Successful in everything you do. Who, how many of you want to be successful in everything you do? Come on. Somebody just needed to wake up. Somebody's like, why is everybody raising their hands? Just raise your hand. You want to be. Turn to the person next to you and say, you'll be successful. You'll be successful if you will stand on God's word even in the battle, right? Here's Joshua. He's going into all kinds of things. God says, here's what you do. 
Take my word. Take the instruction. Stand on it in your life. Build it into your life. You will be successful then in all that you do. In fact, if you go through the Bible, this is some things that the Bible says about God's word. It says his word is a lamp for my feet. His word is a light to my path. His word is flawless. It shields those who take refuge in him. His word makes the simple wise. (laughs) That's good news for me. Right? His word gives knowledge and understanding. His word does not return empty. His word will accomplish his purpose. His word is trustworthy. His word is eternal. His word is to be treasured more than daily bread or Taco Bell. His word is right and true. His word will set you free. His word is powerful. His word is inspired. His word is God-breathed. It's alive. It's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. His word divides soul and spirit. His word word judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. His word never passes away. His word teaches. It rebukes. It corrects. His word prepares us for every good work. His word can build you. His word can heal you. His word can save you. His word can bring you life. In fact, the Bible says the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So why are you just watching a talk show when you could take in some of God's word on a regular basis and let it begin to change your life from the inside out? How do you do that? Well, technology has made it more and more easy for us to stay tuned in to God's word. And you can always go to our central app where we have messages and teaching and all kinds of inspirational information. But another very helpful app is just called the Bible app. In fact, if you're on an Android or an Apple device, just go to your store, just type in the Bible. And I'm going to show you a little video. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. All right, we've got it up here on the screen. Um, So you just type in the Bible, just click the app that looks like the Bible. It says Holy Bible. Okay, we're just going to click that. And then it's going to open it up. And I want you to know there's all kinds of reading plans that are available here. You can look at topics like anxiety, healing, anger, uh, hope. You can just, you can pick one. What, you know, whatever you're feeling right now or going through, whatever you want to know more about, um, you can go down and look at kind of different approaches. There are different devotional things. So all kinds of Bible reading plans. And then, you know, we, you can pick a plan, you click on a plan, and... Um, Once you click on a plan, you'll have some different options. See, you you click on it, and then you can start the plan. You're going to do it by yourself, or do you want to do it with friends? You can actually do a reading plan with friends. And every day, you'll get a little reminder, and you'll have a little devotional reading for that day and something that you can focus on. There's endless kinds of options on the Bible app. All the different translations are there. It doesn't cost a thing. But it's a way that you can lean in and tune in to God's Word on a daily basis. They even have just a scripture of the day. If you're like, man, I just don't have time for that, bro. I'm really busy, you know, COVID. (laughs) Really busy. Getting to the bottom of Netflix. (laughs) All you got to do is just go to the verse of the day. One little verse, take you 20 seconds. But it's a way to just, you know, engage spiritually. So that's available. Take God's word in because it's powerful. Here's another thought, and that's take God's word to heart. Take God's word to heart. Um, For 13 years in our family, we had a bulldog named Roxy. Roxy was um, funny in a lot of ways. One of the things she loved was a bone. If I gave Roxy a bone, she, it was like the best day of her life. She would pee, she'd be so excited, and then, you know, she would take that bone and she would chew on it and chew on it, chew on it, gnaw on it. She, she didn't get a lot of bones because she would chew on it so intensely her gums would bleed, it would make a total mess. She didn't stop because of the blood. The blood was irrelevant. It was like, you know, a drug addict getting a drug in the moment, right? She's like, oh, oh. She would, she would make sounds over the bone while she would chew it. She would like have this little kind of murmur like, mm. and then And then almost like a growl, like, yeah, bone. And then the funniest thing, she only did this with bones, but she would, if, if anybody came close to the bone, she would growl like, mm, you know, back up. But then she would try to bury her bone 
to hide it so she could come back to it. The problem was we just had tile on the floor. So she would go to, the, to, to a little space on the floor that she would pick. She would like think nobody's watching this. And then she would start digging on the tile, <sighs> digging her imaginary hole. And she would dig it for a minute. And then she would put the bone right there in her imaginary hole. I kid you not, where she learned this, I have no idea. And she would nose the dirt over the bone. Have you ever seen an animal do this that's never been outside except to go to the bathroom? You know, like she's pushing the dirt now over the bone and then she would walk away like it was hidden. It was done and the bone's just sitting on the tile floor. I'm like, you are not the smartest animal out there. She loved that bone. Well, Eugene Peterson wrote a book called Eat This Book and he talks about the Hebrew word for meditate. And it's interesting because we're about to look at Joshua chapter one, verse eight, and in this verse, we see this word meditate come up. The word meditate is the same word used in Isaiah. It's the same Hebrew word for when a lion growls over its prey, like to enjoy it and to protect it. It's the same idea of when a dog like worries a bone. This is what we're supposed to do with God's word in our heart and life, to chew on it, to reflect on it, to appreciate it, to treasure it, and to allow it to take root in our life. Look at what God says to Joshua chapter one, beginning in verse eight. He says, study this book of instruction continually, what? Meditate, that's the idea. Chew on it, ruminate on it, enjoy it, bury it in your heart, hello. Meditate on it, when? Day and night, so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. God's saying, look, take this word, the, my word, my revelation, chew on it, meditate on it, let it take root in your life. It, it's like, I, I grew up in Amarillo, Texas, and about 45 miles away was a town called Hereford. Hereford had a feedlot, and when the wind blew the right direction, you would smell the poo of all the cows. The whole city would smell it. And if you were to just walk into the town when the wind was blowing the right direction, you'd be like, oh, that's, that's nasty right there. But you know what they called it in my hometown? The smell of money. That's the smell of money. So cows, I'm familiar. Cows do this thing where they, they chew and then they swallow. And then they throw it up in their mouth and then they chew it some more and then they swallow. Then they throw it up then they chew it some more, and then they swallow, chewing the cud. That's what we're supposed to do with God's word. By the way, imagine if we did that with like food. You'll be like, that nacho was amazing. I'm just, I'm just gonna have it again. <laughs> Come on, an appetizer. Bring it back, chew it, swallow it up. I had to go there, ladies, just for you. Gotta gross people out. We're to take God's word and meditate on it. Now, for centuries, believers engaged in a practice that was, that was known as spiritual reading. Spiritual reading, it actually had four parts to it. Uh, one was to read. Number two was to pray. So if you read something, let's say you go to version, you start a Bible reading plan, or you start a devotional, you see a scripture, you read it, stop, think about it, pray about it. You know, God, give me insight into that, help me understand. Uh, then um, meditate on it, you know, like maybe, maybe sit with it for a while and then even contemplate it. That was the fourth thing that they would do where you're actually gonna, you're gonna go through the day and you're gonna really think about that and chew on it in your life. And that lets God's word get down in your heart. I'm gonna tell you over the last year, um, I've read the Bible more in my own personal life than I have in years. And, and, and it hasn't been to get teaching stuff or to be able to do ministry or church related things. I've gone to the Bible more in the last year because I needed help and I needed guidance. I needed God to show up, help me lead, help me make wise decisions, help me know what to do. You read the Bible different when you're in a battle, right? We don't, I don't got time to speculate. I need help. 
I, I, don't, I may not have it all figured out, and it's okay. You read the Bible. Look, the Bible was written over thousands of years in a different, different cultural context than our own. You can't just project back our culture onto the culture in which the Bible was written. So you're going to read some things that maybe are shocking or that you don't understand, or you're like, dude, how's this guy have a thousand wives? What is up? Right? But if you keep reading, and it's okay. You're like, you don't have to understand. You don't have to agree with everything you read because you may not even understand it in the way it was meant to be understood. But just stay with it and let God shape you and form you. And over time, it will begin to transform you for the positive. So I've gone to the Bible again and again because I needed God's help. And I needed to take in his word, but I also needed to take it to heart. Battlefield reading. Third thing we do then is we live God's word out. In our lives. Joshua chapter 1 9, God says this to Joshua to just get him ready for the battles that he's gonna face. And he says, This is my command be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is what? With you wherever you go. God is with you wherever you go. In fact, Philip Yancey was once asked, he's a great Christian thinker and leader. He was asked, how would you summarize the Bible in one sentence? He said this, God gets his family back. Like the relationship with God is what's the priority in our lives and, and in the creation. And you see that coming out in God's word. Now Joshua was about to face a wall. He would get over the Jordan River, come into the promised land, and the first thing he faced was a battle. You would think God led his people to the promised land over 40 years, the battles would, behind them, would be behind them. No, no, the first thing they faced is a battle. City of Jericho, the walls are huge, and they're basically supposed to walk around the walls once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day, they're supposed to walk around them seven times and shout, and the walls will collapse. Hello. And that's exactly what happens. God gives him clear instruction. But God had already implanted in his heart and mind before the power of his word to be ready to face a battle. And you look through the Bible, you see God move again and again in people's lives. I mean, Abraham and Sarah, they faced their own wall. They had a wall of inf uh, infertility and infertility of broken dreams, but God made a way through the wall. And they became um, literally the, the parents of the Jewish people. Moses, he faced a wall of his own guilt, but God made a way through the wall and he went on to lead his people to freedom. You go on through the Old Testament, David faced a wall through his continued moral failure, but God made a way through the wall and continued to use him. Elijah, the prophet, faced a wall of his own discouragement, but God made a way through that wall and used him. Ruth faced a wall of heartbreak and loss, but God made a way through that wall and her life was restored. Daniel faced a wall of persecution, but God made a way through the wall and he survived the lion's den. Zacchaeus in the New Testament and faced a wall of greed and hatred, but God made a way through the wall and he found forgiveness and grace. The woman at the well who encounters Jesus faced a wall of sexual sin and discrimination, but God made a way through the wall and she found new life. The leper who faced a wall of disease and exile found that God could make a way through the wall and he could find healing and community. Peter faced a wall of personal failure when he denied Christ three times, but God made a way through through the wall, and Peter went on to lead the early church community. Listen, Lazarus faced the ultimate wall, death, and yet God made a way through the wall and led him to new life. The God who is beside you is bigger than the wall that is in front of you. And Joshua learned that lesson before he got to the wall, right? He learned it back here when he began to take in God's word and meditate it in his heart and life and allow it to transform him. Listen, God is bigger than your diagnosis. He's bigger than the bad news. He's bigger than whatever happened to you. He's bigger than what you're fighting. He's bigger than what you're fearing. He's bigger than what you're missing. He's bigger than the lies. He's bigger than the hype. He's bigger than the virus. He's bigger than our divisions. He's bigger than our economy. He's bigger than our problems. He's bigger than what's happening in the past, and he's bigger than whatever is on the way. And so his command is this, and by the way, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. 
His command is this, do not be afraid. We read it together. Do not be discouraged because your God is with you wherever you go. So, stand on his word. You'll stay strong in the battle. What exactly does that look like? Well, maybe it looks like this. When your plans have crashed, maybe this next week, then you just stand on God's word and you begin to repeat to yourself, Jeremiah 29, where God says, I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope and a future. You declare it in your life. You declare it over your situation. You stand on it in faith. When you come to the end of your strength, you just stand on God's strength. In Philippians 4, you say, look, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When you feel like your burdens are crushing you, you stand on God's word in Matthew 11 where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When you feel weak, you stand on God's word where it says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. When you feel like you aren't forgiven, you stand on God's word that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you aren't sure what to do, stand on God's word where it says those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Listen, when everything has changed and been flipped upside down, stand on God's word where he says, I'm about to do something new. Do you not see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. When it seems like everything is against you, you stand on God's word. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's try that again. If God is for us, who can be against this? You speak God's word over your life. You stand on it. You claim it in faith. And then one day when we all get to the end of our journey, we stand on God's word where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I have defeated death. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. How you leverage God's word in the battle? You stand on it. You stand on it, and it will empower you to stay strong in the battle. His word starts to get into you. It shapes your thoughts. Take it to heart. You don't just want to get through the Bible. You want to let the Bible get through you, right? Chew on it. Ruminate on it. Work it like a dog works a bone. Meditate on it. And that word can make you successful, ultimately, everywhere you go and everywhere you engage. I know some of you are hurting. I know some of you feel like you're right in the throes of battle. Lean into prayer, like we talked about last week. Lean into God's word, stand on it, like we've just talked about. And next week, we're gonna talk about the power of worship. These are the tools that God has given us to help us lean into him as he fights our battles. We may be in the battle, but God owns the battle. It's his battle. And so let's let him fight the battle. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith in your life. I'd love to just give you that opportunity to come to Christ and place your faith and your trust in him. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, you can begin that journey today by repeating a simple prayer after me, either out loud or in your own heart and mind. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges I'm up against. I surrender my life to you in Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air just to say before God and to say to me, you're going to follow him. You're going to trust him in your life today. Just slip your hand in the air. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's reach out to him today. God, we thank you for your love, and I thank you for each person reaching out to you and pray you'll fill them with your forgiveness, your power, your, your goodness, your encouragement, 
walk with them in their battles, for all of us, walk with us and strengthen us. We pray for your blessing over the struggles in our lives. We pray that you will guide us each day and God continue to show up and work. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their lives today. Listen, if you made a spiritual commitment, I just wanna tell you congratulations. Uh, we'd love to share a resource that we've created with you called How to Follow Jesus. Just go to central.family in your mobile browser. Click the link that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. And um, you can get your free resource today. We'll send that to you. It'll help you like navigate and grow and learn over the next couple weeks as a new follower of Jesus. So make sure to let us know if you made a spiritual commitment. Well, at this time, I'm gonna ask you to please remain seated and let's put our hands together for Pastor Nick as he's gonna close out our experience. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Judd, for that incredible message of hope. Hey, if you made that decision today, if you raised your hand, I want to say congratulations and let you know it's one of the best decisions you'll ever make. And like Pastor Judd mentioned, we have a resource we would love to provide you with. All you have to do is visit central.family, click the button that says, I decided to follow Jesus, and we'll provide you with that guide as soon as we can. Well, this week we have some exciting things coming up. Don't forget, if you have a student who's in middle school or high school, have them join us for CY Nights this Wednesday night. Also, Refresh, it's an incredible women's event. It's happening on April 17th. Early bird pricing ends tonight, so you don't want to miss out on that $25 deal. You can find all of this at central.family. We're so glad that you joined us this weekend. As you go through your week, remember to hang on to what Romans 8 says. If God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.